Good morning, everybody, and good afternoon, wherever we may find you across the country. Welcome to the 2021 National Conference of the American Association of Hispanics in Higher Education, or AHI. My name is Victor Sines, Chair and Professor in the Department of Educational Leadership and Policy at the University of Texas at Austin. And I'm honored to serve as the Chair-Elect of the AHI Board of Directors, as well as a member of the 2021 AHI Conference Planning Committee. Today, I will be presiding over our opening plenary session, which will feature many distinguished representatives of our scholarly and practitioner community. You will hear from our board chair, Dr. Patricia Redondo, from our sponsors and our partners, from our conference planning committee co-chairs, Dr. David Perez and Dr. Nancy Acevedo Gil, and from our graduate fellow program co-chairs, Natalia Toscano and Luis Aviles Gonzalez. The opening plenary will culminate with the 37th annual Tomas Rivera Lecture, featuring John King, former Secretary of Education and current President and CEO of the Education Trust. But more on that shortly. So first, I'm gonna go ahead and share my slides this morning to help uh, everybody who's listening follow along. And uh, if you bear with me one second. All right. I wanna highlight a, a few things about the conference that could help really maximize your experience with us today. First, I'll invite you to download our conference program if you haven't already done so. Um, you can find it as a registered uh, conference participant on our website. And there is a web page uh, in case you need to um, uh, tag it uh, or, or type it out. I encourage you to do so if you're not already downloaded that conference PDF, please do so at your convenience. In addition, you will be receiving daily email reminders from our IHE staff. You should have received some this morning as a registered participant in our 2021 virtual conference. Uh, and you'll receive similar emails every morning with key information, helpful links, Zoom links, et cetera, uh, to really help maximize uh, your experience throughout the week. Uh, also, all of our sessions will be delivered through Zoom platform. And by now, after almost a year of engaging in Zoom meetings and, and workshops, I, we hope that you are well-versed in how to do that, but I'll encourage you to use speaker view as a way to ensure that uh, our different speakers throughout our plenary sessions each, each day are, are highlighted in your viewer. So I'll encourage all of you to do that now. If you haven't already done so, you can toggle that as an option up in your, in your uh, view screen options uh, to use speaker view. And then finally, just as another reminder, uh, we are fully virtual and that includes also engaging with each other um, through social media. So I encourage all of you uh, to post, to tag, to share your sessions, uh, your experiences uh, through our various social media channels, either on Facebook or on Twitter. Uh, and there's our, 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 uh, our, our feed, our ahi. Excuse me, ahi org is our, uh, our, uh, our Twitter and Facebook name. And also to use the hashtag ahi21 throughout your conference experience. So now that I've gotten that out of the way, um, I, I uh, invite all of you now to um, help me welcome. It is indeed my distinct honor to invite our AHI board chair, Dr. Patricia Redondo, to offer the official welcome and introduction to our conference. Dr. Redondo holds a doctoral degree in counseling psychology from Boston University and is a licensed psychologist. She's a founding president of the National Latino, Latino Psychological Association, past president of APA Division 45 and American Counseling Association. Her latest book is Latinx Families in the US, Transcending Acculturation, Xenophobia and Migration Through Self-Determination, published in 2018. And for the last two years, I might add that Dr. Arando has served as the chair of our board of directors, leading our association through pretty significant organizational change. Uh, she has been our fearless leader, has helped us get through some pretty significant changes for the organization and has brought us now leading this association to our 16th annual conference. And so without any further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Patricia Adondo, our board chair. 
Gracias, Victor. Uh, pleasure to join you today and be part of this uh, first, as we say, our first uh, virtual conference. Uh, it's my pleasure to say bienvenidos, bienvenidas to our conference and to also restate maybe what Victor has acknowledged that this is a conference that is welcoming uh, many people from around the country but also with some first, not just the virtual nature of it, but some first as you'll hear in my introductions. So with that, I'd like to uh, move to our formal opening, which is the acknowledgement of the land. And this is a tradition we'd like to begin here at our annual AHI conferences. So I'd like you to just uh, view the screen, which reads, we acknowledge the first peoples of our countries as the custodians and occupants of the traditional lands where we live, work, and recreate. We pay our respects to the elders, past, present, the seven generations yet to come, and to their continued connection to the land and community. Everywhere we are, we are on indigenous land. So thank you. And with that, I want to also acknowledge that this reading came from my colleagues in Division 45 of APA, who've written a wonderful book called The Warrior's Path, uh, which acknowledges the great contributions of indigenous people uh, to psychology, to, so to society as a whole, and of course, to us here at AHI. Let's continue with some of the important parts of this program today, which are uh, introducing the board of directors of AHI, my colleagues. Uh, we have a, a wonderful group that has been very committed and dedicated to the work of the organization in this time of transition. Some new board members who joined us last year. The immediate past chair is uh, Joanne Canales, and she has been uh, working again with the board for probably about seven years. Our executive committee is comprised of Joanne, Victor, um, Carmen Martinez Lopez, who's our treasurer, and Asada Santiago Rivera, who's our treasurer elect. Our other distinguished board members include um, I should say that uh, I could also say they're all doctors, but I'll just go Dr. Wader uh, Cruzado, president of Montana State University. Uh, I'm looking at the screen, Adriana Flores Ragale, uh, Aurora Camimura at Washington University, Tomas Leal with Fielding, Graduate University, Patricia Perez, California State University, and Patrick Valdez, uh, with uh, two, uh, Zoom, uh, two, I shouldn't uh, get the title correct, uh, but with his new organization. Um, moving on to the next slide, Victor. I'd like to uh, acknowledge our new uh, board of directors. Uh, recently, we had an election. This was the first election in AHI history to uh, elect members to the board of directors. Uh, I'm very proud of the work the board did to uh, acknowledge a graduate student and a faculty member to join the board. So with that, those two individuals, we have um, Dr. Claudia Garcia Lewis, who is our newly elected member to serve on the uh, faculty board position. She's an assistant professor in education leadership and policy studies with the University of Texas in San Antonio. And assuming the graduate student member at large role is Monique Posadas, who's at the Claremont Graduate University School of Educational Studies. And we're very, very pleased to welcome them. And they will formally join us at our uh, July meeting, our first meeting for the new fiscal year. But we will be spending time with them prior to that. And we're very appreciative of all the individuals who uh, elected, chose to run for office. This was the first time. 
I'd like to also acknowledge the board members who will be uh, leaving AHI, uh, Board of Directors. We start with Louis Olivas, who's our founding president. Jim Estrada, who's with uh, Estrada Consulting. Dr. Jaime Chayin, who's been with the board. He's also a founding member for many years, since, 20, uh, to, since 2005. And uh, the immediate um, chair, past chair, uh, Dr. Joan Canales, who is also rotating off the board. We want to give them sincere thanks and we'll acknowledge them further at one of the award ceremonies later this week. And then finally, I'd like to recognize our business partners, AMC Source. Uh, AMC Source uh, entered into a relationship with AHI on July 1st of this past year. Uh, we recognize that in order to do the heavy lifting that AHI has to do, and that has been staffed by a few people led by Dr. Olivas over the years, we needed uh, uh, many resources to do this. So I'd like to simply call out uh, Dr. Lucia Gutierrez, who is our executive director, and many of you have heard from her during this planning process. And she's an amazing woman and an amazing executive director. Our other two key staff are Rosie Rivera, who has helped many of you with your membership, as well as registration for this conference, and Luis Hernandez, Lourdes Hernandez with the finance department. So I'm very grateful to all of the individuals who continue to lift AHI and uh, guide us in our, our years of continued progress. And with this, I'll turn it back to uh, Victor. You're not, uh, you need to unmute Victor. Thank you so much, Dr. Arredondo. I know I speak for the entire board we say how truly fortunate and grateful we are for your leadership over the last year and a half uh, serving in this role. I just want to point out uh, that she has served as chair, not for one year, but for now going on her second year. And, and that was uh, partly a, as a, an extension of her uh, generosity in, in, in offering us an opportunity to have the organization be led by her. And uh, we're so appreciative for your leadership and continue to uh, benefit greatly uh, from your guidance and wisdom as our leader. So, muchas gracias. All right. So, we're going to keep moving, and uh, we now have um, our next uh, key uh, acknowledgments here. And uh, of course, all of you understand that uh, these sorts of events, whether we're in person or virtual, require a significant amount of support and thought partnership from some, um, you know, uh, a whole entire collection of, of individuals and of organizations. So if you would indulge me just for one second to share uh, some of the sponsors for our conference. We start with our uh, AMBAD or AMBER sponsors, Texas State University, Fielding Graduate University, uh, CSUN, which is Cal State Northridge, Texas A&M University, Cal State LA, uh, University of Utah Health, and CSU San Bernardino. Uh, all of these represent our, our, our AMBAR or AMBER sponsors for the conference. Our JADE sponsors, University of Texas at Austin Department of Educational Leadership and Policy, as well as the Division of Diversity and Community Engagement. Uh, we were joint sponsors, JADE sponsors of the conference, as well as California State University Monterey Bay. Our ONIC sponsors this year include Cal Poly, uh, Pomona, uh, Montana State University, Eastern Connecticut University and Long Beach State, uh, which is also part of the Cal State system. Just wanna recognize that the Cal State system is very, very well represented among our sponsors here. Um, and of course, uh, we are also gonna be honoring uh, the leader of the Cal State system uh, later this week, uh, the new um, chancellor, Joseph Castro. Um, so uh, to continue our Turquesa sponsors, yet another Cal State, in this case, Cal Poly Pomona, uh, choral sponsors include The Ohio State University, their Office of Diversity and Inclusion, and our NACAR sponsors uh, include the advisory, excuse me, the Arredondo Advisory Group and, uh, and Wall Breakers. Uh, again, none of these, um, all of these are significant supporters and sponsors to our annual conference. In many cases, they're repeat sponsors. And again, we cannot thank them enough for their continued 
uh, generosity and support of our efforts. In addition to our, our conference sponsors, we have several uh, AHI uh, partners that we want to acknowledge now as well. And these are a set of corporate uh, and philanthropic organizations and companies that have long supported um, uh, AHI in our annual conferences, and in many cases, sponsor uh, or uh, support individual awards, et cetera. So I'll start first with uh, latinosinhighereducation.com, which has been a longtime supporter of our efforts in helping us to broadcast and sort of get the word out about our association and our various different um, uh, services, including job postings, et cetera. The University of Utah's uh, Office of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, the most recent uh, AHI partner, we, we recently entered into a uh, uh, memorandum of understanding with, uh, with the University of Utah. It will be our new host for the, the New Leaders Academy that we're very, very excited to, to relaunch here in the coming year. Uh, Sage Publishing, also a longtime supporter in our collaborations with the Journal of Hispanic Higher Education, Indeed, uh, the uh, editor of JHHE is one of our award recipients this year, Ms. Esther Molnix, and we'll be honoring her later this week. Uh, the Hispanic Outlook in Higher Education, yet another important media sponsor and supporter and partner for us for many years uh, in, in particularly publishing two different um, outlets for our graduate fellows and our faculty fellows on a monthly basis. So we cannot thank them enough for the many, many years of partnership uh, with Hispanic Outlook, and we uh, certainly look forward to continued support uh, and partnership with them. Uh, and then finally, I'll, I'll finish with UPS, and UPS also a longtime supporter of our efforts. In fact, sponsoring one of our more significant awards for the conference. Uh, we're going to hear from them uh, later this week as we honor Dr. William Serata as the Community College Award recipient for this year. And uh, UPS has been a longtime supporter and sponsor of that particular award. And you know, generally speaking, of, uh, a significant corporate sponsor for AHI. So, but lastly, and I save the best for last year because you know, perhaps the most uh, significant sponsor and partner for AHI uh, going on from the very, very beginning of our existence has been the Educational Testing Service, ETS. And, and I wanna welcome to, uh, to the conference this year, Ms. Lenora Green, who serves as the Executive Director for the Center for Advocacy and Philanthropy. ETS, just to give you a sense, uh, helps to support our various different efforts to help acknowledge uh, excellence to our association. Uh, starting, of course, with our outstanding dissertation competition. Uh, they've long, been a longtime partner in helping to support and recognize outstanding emerging scholars within our community through our outstanding dissertation competition. And later this week, we will be honoring the, this year's awardees. I, I invite all of you to come back uh, you know, for that day when we will be honoring them uh, on Wednesday. Um, in addition, um, they have been a long time uh, partner with us in the AHI ETS Latinx Student Success Institute. This is a pre annual pre-conference session that was hosted on Friday, uh, this year led by Dr. Luis Ponjuan, Dr. Di Fernandez, and, and Dr. Magdalena Martinez. And uh, once again, yet another way that ETS for many, many years has partnered with us as a key thought partner in helping us to design and implement our annual conference. And last but not least is our Tomar Rivera Lecture. Uh, this is our 37th annual Tomar Rivera Lecture. Uh, and ETS, of course, is a key partner with us in, in hosting that particular lecture. This year will be offered by John B. King, former Secretary of Education and current CEO and President of the Education Trust. So with that, I'm going to uh, stop share just for a second, because I do want to say a few more words about uh, Lenora. Over the last decade, Lenora Green has served as the Executive Director of the ETS Center for Advocacy and Philanthropy, overseeing philanthropy, social investment, community relations, and employee engagement uh, for this uh, global organization. She also focuses on education advocacy by building and managing strategic relationships and collaborations with key national, regional, and local organizations that promote educational opportunity, particularly for disadvantaged or historically underserved communities. Um, among the center's objectives are to use philanthropy and advocacy to help mitigate educational challenges for these communities and to identify, support, and replicate programs that are achieving results. It is in this particular count that AHI and ETS partnership has prospered significantly. 
uh, for going on a decade plus now. Uh, Ms. Green has extensive experience in working with nonprofit and community organizations like AHI. Uh, she served on the National Urban League's Advisory Council and the College Access and Success uh, Advisory Board, as well as the Advisory Board for APLU, uh, the Office of Access and Success. Um, she also has a, a foothold in a variety of nonprofit uh, boards uh, around the country, uh, including on the board of CASA, the Court Appointed Special Advocate for Children of Mercer and Burlington Counties in New Jersey. Uh, currently, she serves on the Advisory Council of Parents Step Ahead, a Texas-based nonprofit organization focusing on family and community engagement in schools, and is on various other boards of local and educational entities across the region where she lives and serves. We are honored and proud to partner with Lenora and with ETS, and without any further ado, I will now invite her to offer a few words of welcome on behalf of our esteemed partnership with the Educational Testing Service. Lenora. Well, thank you, Victor, for that uh, very nice uh, introduction and, and your kind acknowledgement of ETS's work. Uh, buenas tardes a todos. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so pleased to join you virtually this afternoon and bring you greetings from ETS in Princeton, New Jersey. Congratulations on your 16th annual conference. We are honored to be the sponsor for the pre-conference Student Success Institute, the Tomas Rivera Lecture, and I know you are as excited as I am to hear from John King, who will deliver this year's um, yeah, lecture, and the Outstanding Dissertation Competition Awards that recognizes and honors talented scholars. The three awardees will present on their dissertations during this conference, and we are so proud of them and their scholarship. And I, I'd be remiss if I did not acknowledge that one of the first, um, and maybe the first uh, winner of the ODC award is on the AHI board, Dr. Patricia Perez. So it is so nice to see you, Dr. Perez. You have just had an amazing journey. Um, so uh, we just thank you for continuing to do all the great work that you're doing. Since 2006, ETS has contributed more than $1 million to AHI in support of the organization's mission to advance Hispanic higher education. At a time when there is still a dearth of Latinx scholars in tenured faculty positions and college and university presidents in the US, and at a time when Latinx enrollment in graduate and professional school still lags behind that of other groups, we can think of no investment more important than this one. And it is AHI who is working to improve these outcomes. So thank you for giving ETS the opportunity to join you on this important journey. Best wishes for what I know will be an immensely informative, insightful, and inspirational conference. Adelante. Muchas gracias, Lenora, and once again, thank you, thanks to you, thanks to ETS for your continued thought partnership, and uh, I know we, we treasure and value this relationship greatly, and uh, it's in great, great hands going forward. Uh, we appreciate all your continued support and advocacy uh, as we advance our joint missions to uh, continue to, to promote access opportunity for all underserved communities in higher education. So I'm going to now ask all of us to uh, turn our attention to the, uh, the key principles for our conference this year that have made this possible, that have brought together and harnessed the collective energy, expertise, wisdom of our broader membership of scholars, of graduate students, of practitioners. And uh, in so doing, let me acknowledge and, uh, and welcome our two co-chairs for the conference planning committee. I'll uh, start first with Dr. David Perez, who's an associate professor at Syracuse University of, of Higher Education. He is the AHI 2021 conference chair. I'll just point out, if I may, point of personal privilege. Dr. Perez is a longtime colleague and friend of mine. And uh, when I first, when we first approached him with this opportunity uh, about a year ago, um, he did not hesitate. He did not flinch. And I just wanted to acknowledge and thank him for stepping up when the, uh, his association needed him in this leadership role. And in his infinite wisdom, he was very, very uh, smart to select as a co-chair for the IE 2021 Conference Planning Committee, 
Dr. Nancy Acevedo Gill. Uh, Dr. Acevedo Gill is also an associate professor, in this case, Cal State University in San Bernardino, and has been a long time participant in the AHI conference. In fact, both David and Nancy have been regular attendees for years and years. We won't say how long, but it goes back a ways. And, uh, and they've also been also participants in our various different fellows program. So uh, they're clearly committed members of our association and we're so quick both to accept the opportunity uh, and responsibilities to serve as our conference planning committee co-chairs. So now I will turn it over to, uh, to Dr. Perez and Dr. Savel Gill uh, for them to speak a little bit more about our conference planning as well as uh, acknowledge and thank our conference planning committee. David and Nancy, turn it over to you. Thank you, Victor. Um, bienvenidos, welcome. Um, as you already know, my name is David Perez II, and I'm the current uh, chair of AHI's Conference Planning Committee. Um, before going any further, I, I would like to acknowledge the Onondaga Nation, the fire keepers of the Haudenosaunee, the indigenous peoples on whose ancestral land Syracuse University now stands. Um, in addition to serving as an associate professor of higher education at SU, um, I chaired AHI's Conference Planning Committee this year, along with my colleague, Elmana, and friend, um, Dr. Nancy Acevedo. Thank you, David. Hi, everyone, welcome. I'm Nancy Acevedo, and I am the incoming chair of the AHI Conference Planning Committee. Um, I also would like to recognize that California State University San Bernardino sits on the territory and ancestral land of the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians. We recognize that every member of the CSUSD community has benefited and continues to benefit from the colonization and use of its land since the institution's founding in 1965. On behalf of the committee, um, our hope is that you, your families and other loved ones are doing well in the midst of all that is transpiring um, in our country right now and, and in the world. For the past 16 years, AHI has endeavored to address a range of social issues affecting Latinx communities, particularly within the field of higher education. To honor that commitment, the Conference Planning Committee purposely developed this year's conference theme, Sembrando Semillas, reimagining the contours of Latinx communities within higher education and the conference strands to provide you, members of the association and its leadership with opportunities to engage in dialogue about the roots of anti-Blackness, homophobia, xenophobia, and how we perpetuate or disrupt these and other forms of oppression collectively to tend to the soil that nourishes us, our families and communities to and through higher education, and to plant seeds that bear fruit in 2021 and the years to come. Nancy, did I lose you? There we go. Uh, planning AHI's first virtual conference was no easy feat, but we are deeply grateful to the graduate students, faculty, and administrators that volunteered over the past year. In addition to planning the plenary and concurrent sessions, members of the committee will be hosting events to provide attendees with opportunities to engage in self-care, socialize, and network. We encourage you all to participate in brief social activities, for example, self-massage, mindfulness, and yoga that are organized twice each day. Reserve a virtual room in our breakout lounge to connect with colleagues informally between the hours of 1.30 p.m. and 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Attend the networking cafes at 5 p.m. and address a range of personal, academic, and professional topics. To express our gratitude, we'd like to briefly acknowledge each committee member by name. Audrey Baca. Jason Arrington Rivera. Jorge Bulmiki. Elsa Camargo. Marlene de la Cruz. Herman Diaz. Mary Dueñas. Antonio Duran. Jorge Figueroa. Glenda Flores. Eliquin Onel. Elsa Gonzalez. Ignacio Nacho Hernandez. And Susana Hernandez. Adrian Huerta. Vanessa Martinez. Nancy Mendoza. Roberto Orozco. Joanna Perez. Monica Quesada. Alejandra Rincón. Cristóbal Salinas. Marisa Vasquez. 
Ángel Vélez. Kristen Venegas. And Yolanda Cepeda. We'd also like to acknowledge the previous conference planning committee chairs, Victor Sainz and Jeanette Castellanos, AHI's chair, Patricia Arendondo, and members of the board of directors, the association's new executive director, Lucia Gutierrez, and AHI's founder, Luis Olivas, for their ongoing support of the committee. In closing, we encourage you all to immerse yourself in the 2021 AHI National Conference. Planning the 2021 conference has been an amazing experience and I'm grateful for the leadership and friendship of Dr. David Perez II. Next year, we will do continue this work. If you're interested in serving on the conference planning committee for 2022, please make sure to send an email and contact me. Thank you. Thank you, David and Nancy. And I, and I appreciate you both uh, acknowledging all of the amazing members of our conference planning committee. Uh, having participated in, in various meetings throughout the last few months, uh, you know, I think all of the attendees are in great, great hands. They have designed an outstanding conference program for the next few days and uh, truly harnessed the, the amazing energy and expertise throughout our entire community. So thank you once again. And in Nancy's case, uh, not only does she agree to be a co-chair this year, but part of that role includes her returning uh, next year as our 2022 AHI conference uh, planning committee uh, chair and uh, she'll be looking I know for a co-chair as well as members for that committee so I'll just put one more plug in Nancy uh, for any of you who may be interested in, in uh, you know uh, supporting the organization and paying it forward in this way uh, we would greatly appreciate it please uh, reach out to Nancy her email is there is on is on your screen uh, I know she would be uh, she would welcome uh, the, the uh, support and help um, as we prepare and think about next year Okay, so I'm gonna continue now and uh, turn our attention now to one of the signature programs of AHI. The 2021 Graduate Student Fellows Program for AHI is now in its, uh, gosh, 20th or so cycle, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it, it actually is older than the, the, the association itself because the Graduate Student Fellows Program existed in the years even before he was a formal association, when it was still part of the Hispanic Caucus of the American Association of Higher Education, an organization that no longer exists. But nonetheless, 16 years ago, our founders saw fit to not only create a new organization, but ensure that our Graduate Student Fellows Program found a home. And as such, this has become truly our signature program, the embodiment of our mission to help advance uh, the future nurturing and talent of Latinx higher education scholars and leaders. And this year, we're so proud and honored to have two outstanding leaders uh, as uh, chair and co-chair of our Graduate Student Fellows Program. Ms. Natalia Toscano, who is a doctoral student at the University of New Mexico uh, in Chicana Chicano Studies, and Mr. Luis Aviles Gonzalez, who is the GSFP co-chair this year and is a doctoral student at the University of Texas at Austin in linguistics. Uh, I'm now, now going to invite uh, Natalia and Luis. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing so that they can share uh, their slides. Uh, they're gonna walk us through an acknowledgement of uh, the 2021 AHI Graduate Student Fellows uh, for this current year. Natalia and Luis, uh, yeah. the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. I'm so happy to be here with everyone out here in Albuquerque, New Mexico, Pueblo land, and with my um, co-chair, Luis Aviles. It's been such an honor to be able to be the chair for this, this AHI year, you know, given the climate that we're in, to be able to support fellows on their journey um, to the finish line of obtaining their PhD and beyond. And then I'm not sure where Luis is. There. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Luis. As I was mentioned earlier, I have the honor of co-chairing with the amazing Natalia Toscano. And yes, let's get it rolling. <laughs> yes. So of course, due to the you know climate that we're in, uh, we had to completely re-envision this fellow program. And so we just wanted to give a snapshot of how this year has been going for us. We won't be concluding our program until May. So we're excited to still be building community with our fellows up until then. We meet with them. Um, bi-monthly with workshops with our alumni, with community partners and members, with topics varying from mental health, um, how to prepare for the job market, 
how to tackle writing during a pandemic and how to uh, support each other on a virtual platforms. And we've revisioned our mentorship component with coaches who are out here in the audience. We'd like to shout out our coaches for um, committing themselves to supporting graduate fellows this year in an extended version beyond just the conference period, but building relationships um, and supporting our Latinx graduate students. And yes, we also wanted to share, we're really excited that we've had fellows from all over the country, all over the orange areas where we have fellows from. We have a couple of gaps throughout the country, but we hope that with you all here, you'll continue to promote our graduate fellow program so that we can reach students in the different areas where Latinx students are, and we hope to support them as they thrive through their programs. And with that being said, we wanted to get started and make sure that we acknowledge and celebrate all of our fellows because they are amazing and they're getting through um, this pandemic, not only in, in their home institutions, but through this program together. And so we are going to be honoring not only our fellows, but also our coaches. So please give them virtual hands of applause as we go forward. So we are gonna get started with our STEM uh, fellows. So to acknowledge Andrew Ortiz from UNLV in neuroscience, he shared with us that his role model is his mom who taught him the importance of working hard in life, a quality that has allowed him to continue down the difficult path of academia. Oui. Additionally, we have Celine Cortez from the University of Oklahoma in biomedical science. She shared that her favorite book is Life in uh, Tropical Nature, Life and Death in the Rainforest of Central and South America. It's inspiring because it provides an accessible, enchanting immer immersion into the beauty of ecology and biodiversity. And reading this book during such a critical time in her studies ultimately shaped her current academic journey. Also, Ms. Edaudi Navarro Perez from the University of Arizona in Environmental Science shares a quote that says, I am no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I am changing the things I cannot accept by Angela Davis. Yes, and this amazing set of scholars are being supported by Dr. Ernesto Morales. Um, who, when asked about his mentorship, states that what guides his mentorship is remembering how much mentors meant to me and my career trajectory, but also what some of them did for my character development as well, making sure I was taking care of myself and being mindful of my surroundings. And they are also being supported by Doc Dr. Elsa Gonzalez, whose mentorship is guided by the wish to impact and support our students and junior faculty in the same way a mentor was and is there for her when she needs it. Now with the fellows in the social sciences, we have Carla Venegas from the University of Pennsylvania in Educational Linguistics. She shared with us teaching to transgress by bell hooks. Uh, like desire, language disrupts, refuse to be contained within boundaries. Also, Ms. Amalia Merino at UT Austin in Spanish Linguistics shares that a person who never made a mistake never tried anything new by Albert Einstein. And last but not least, in the social sciences, we have Giovanna Perez from New Mexico State University in psychology. And she shared that yet in that very act lies our survival because a woman who writes has power and a woman with power is fear. Gloria Saldua. Yes, and next we have Lisa Parlade uh, from Morgan State University states, one of her favorite book is Yag Giasi's beautifully constructed and written homegoing. Among many reasons, it serves as a reminder of interconnectedness with those who have come before us and the importance to honor and remember our forebears. Know your history so you can know where you're going. Thank you so much for those words, Lisa. Next we have Marta Ortega Mendoza. I am constantly reminded of the sacrifices that my loving parents made when they left their pueblito in Mexico in search for a better life for my siblings and me. And lastly, we have Vanessa Nunes who quotes, sometimes people try to destroy you precisely because they recognize your power, not because they, do, they don't see you, but because they see it and they don't want it to exist, bell hooks. And all of these amazing scholars have been guided by four, these four amazing coaches, starting with Dr. Francisco Villegas who shared, I have been fortunate to follow in the footsteps of mentoring greats. I have been, and, and I'm still guided by the continuous labor of love of Janet Castellanos, Julia Curry Rodriguez, and George Day. While the lessons 
While the lessons they have shared are too numerous to share in a small blurb, they include the importance of humility in listening, the importance of caring, and the recognition of community making as spanning beyond the time we share any program or institution. In short, they never describe or perform mentoring a way that reinscribed a power differential. Instead, it always consisted of a shared space of communal support across all aspects of our lives. Also, we have Dr. Greg Prieto, who shared, I benefited from the GSFP program as a graduate student, and I am honored to be able to reciprocate that mentorship today as a coach. Additionally, Dr. Steven Santa, Santa Ramirez, his participation in mentorship is rooted in giving back and paying it forward alongside other minoritized folks making their way through, their, through the ivory tower. And last but not least, Dr. Cynthia Alcantar, who also shared, I am a product of great mentors who met me where I was at, gave me tools, opened doors, had high expectations, and gave me room to grow. I carry this in my approach to mentorship. Beautiful. Next, we have our interdisciplinary social science scholars, Andrea Constant. Um, who is inspired by Patricia Hill Collins to continue to mark her space within and expand the boundaries of sociology. And next we have Jenny Vilches. Um, the inspirational role models of my academic pilgrimage are all the inspiring women and queer kin who have shown me kindness and support along the way. All those teachers, students, colleagues, musicians, artists, neighbors, and family members, especially my mother and my sister. Beautiful. And next we have Bobby Saman, The Sense of Brown by Jose Esteban Munoz. It has been so inspiring and meaningful for them. We also have an interdisciplinary social science, Leticia Terrones, who shared that Natalie Diaz's poem from the desire field and post-colonial love poem. Is a, is a machine head my heart needs in this pandemic life? I miss the things of being physically around my loved ones. Maricela Chavez, I am often the most inspired by my tia Irene when she's not running the Molino at the crack of dawn in the village she lives in Colima. She's driving stitches, piecing together fabric in her old sewing machine. Her power, her rhythm, her unapologetic joy in the face of too many hardships has helped me find a center and purpose. Beautiful. Uh, Jenny, sorry, Dean Janae Garrett. I came to theory desperate, wanting to comprehend, to grasp what has happened around and within me. Most importantly, I wanted to make the hurt go away, bell hooks. These amazing scholars have been supported by our coach, Dr. Eddie Alvarez, whose mentorship mentorship is guided by the memories and journeys of those who fiercely came before, before them, carved the way, and by those who believed in him when he didn't. Next, we have Dr. Jenny Luna, and they're also supported by Dr. Susana Hernandez, who is guided to serve their community to ensure that they can be their complete selves in, in the academy. And these scholars are also supported by Dr. Christine Vega, whose femtorship is guided um, by the reciprocal relationships co-created during our time together. We are reflection of each other. Thank you so much to these coaches. And we have more. And in, in the interdisciplinary humanities, we have Mr. Gustavo Garcia, who, who shared, research, it requires embodied engagement. It is to stumble upon the sacred and the act of return. It is to get well and whole again, not individually in the privacy of therapy as the West would have it, but collectively with our feet on the ground. As Chicanx writers, artists, and activists, we research for a people. Cherry Moraga throwing shade to the West. We also have Mary Lou Rodriguez. A book that inspires her is When I Was Puerto Rican by Esmeralda Santiago. It reminds her of what is both so familiar and unknown to her from her roots. And last but not least of our fellows, Mr. Joel Calixto. Mi ama, mom, Irma Calixto, and the creativity she radiates every day in order to navigate this chaotic, chaotic world inspires me to keep pushing forward while remaining kind and loving at all times. And these amazing scholars are being supported by Dr. Jose M. Aguilar Hernandez, 
As an advisor, I am guided by my students' curiosities, passion, courage, and knowledge to help me remain grounded and supported of their academic trajectory. And they're also being supported by Dr. Christ Christina Ruiz Mesa, who shared, my, mentor my mentorship mentorship is guided by the empowering cariño, unconditional support, and the necessary and sometimes hard to hear critical truth that I received from my mentor, Dr. Uh, Terry Nance, throughout my education and career. In addition, we will also like to give a special shout out to the team that has helped us put this event together, this whole fellowship from beginning to end and will continue to help us as we finish the programming in May. We would like to acknowledge the outgoing members, Mr. Uriel Serrano, who shared, I center supporting future scholars of color by promoting ongoing and deeply engaged mentorship and the inclusion of various sources of knowledge. And also, the now turned professora, Dr. Berenice Sanchez. I stay involved and invested in my community because it was my community that supported me and guided me to get to where I am today. We also couldn't do it without Ruby Gonzalez, who stated, I love playing it, paying it forward to the comunidad. No one gets to where they are by themselves. And of course, Roberto Orozco, there is a world beyond what we know and it's worth imagining and working to create that world with a community where we center accountability, love and compassion for each other's existence. This form of community engagement is what keeps me invested, specifically with the queer Latinx uh, old community. Thank you so much to our team. We couldn't have done this without you. And thank you to the AHI community for supporting our graduate fellows. Uh, they are our future and we are so glad to be working with them. Thank you. Excellent job, Natalia and Luis. Thank you so much for that thorough and generous introduction of all of our outstanding fellows for the 2021 cycle. And again, special thanks to both of you. Uh, you have been truly invaluable partners throughout this entire planning process this year. And you took on the challenge of reimagining what the graduate fellows could be for AHI. And I know that your work, your legacy will carry on in the years ahead and future fellows classes. And Luis, and if I'm not mistaken, I think you're back next year as the uh, the, the incoming chair and uh, there will be a new co-chair identified uh, for the for the among this current cohort group that you just uh, introduced. And, and that is a spirit of sort of paying it forward. I think that is really embedded in, in, in many of the aspects of what we do as an association and is deeply embodied in the work of our graduate fellows. So thank you. I know all of our founders, those of whom are with us today, uh, would be very, very proud of, of, of y'all continue to carry that legacy forward. So thank you so, so much. Now, we're, we're almost to the, uh, the, the, the 37th annual Tamari Vera Lecture. And um, I, uh, I wanna just do a quick check-in with our partners at AMC, Doreen and Lucia. I just wanna make sure that, that, uh, that John King is with us or will be joining us. He is, all right, great. Yes, he is. Uh, <laughs> Very good. Uh, you know, thank you so much for, for confirmation. So let me do a couple of things here before because we we're we are on time and we got a, a few minutes and I want to use that time to acknowledge uh, some of the things that have already happened for our conference and that includes our pre-conference session. Some of you were fortunate to participate either as presenters or as organizers or as audience members for our various different pre-conference sessions, uh, which occurred on Friday. So the AHI conference annually uh, has a, a pre-conference program that includes several different sessions. I mentioned earlier the AHI ETS Latinx Student Success Institute um, that, that happened Friday morning and uh, led this year by Dr. Luis Ponjuan, Dr. Di Fernandez, Elena Martinez. Uh, I wanna thank them again and I thank ETS once again for uh, their continued support of that institute that has been hosted now annually as part of the IHE conference going back 16 years. So thank you and, and uh, felicidades again to our, 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 uh, in, our organizers. We also hosted uh, for I believe the fourth or fifth year in a row now, the Latinx Leadership Institute. Uh, this year featuring two outstanding higher education leaders, uh, Dr. Ana Marie Causet from the University of Washington, where she's president, been president now for several years, and Dr. Thomas Parham, who's president of CSU Dominguez Hills. Uh, that session, that institute was organized by our board chairwoman, uh, Dr. Patricia Redondo. And again, uh, thank you once again to our presenters for the Latinx Leadership Institute. 
Uh, as I said, we, we're, we're deeply committed to both nurturing the next generation of emerging scholars, but also the next generation of emerging Latinx leaders for higher education. And that institute, as well as, of our, new, as well as our new Leaders Academy, is a big, big part of that commitment. Uh, we also hosted our third annual Community College Institute, led by my, my two colegas on the board of directors, Dr. Carmen Martinez Lopez, who is our treasurer, and also dean at Westchester Community College, and uh, also co-led by Dr. Patrick Valdez, who is now at 2U.com, most recently was chancellor of the University of New Mexico Taos campus, a two-year institution. Um, and both of them are, are fellow board members. And, and they're invited uh, special guests and panelists for our, our CCI this year uh, was my colleague here at UT Austin, Dr. Linda Garcia, who's the executive director of the Center for Community College Student Engagement. And, uh, and of course, Dr. Steven Gonzalez, who is the interim chancellor for Maricopa County Community College District, uh, one of the largest community college districts in the entire country. As you can see, an outstanding panel of community college leaders that were present as part of our third annual CCI. And last but certainly not least is our, our good colleague and friend, Dr. Melissa Martinez, who led our pre-conference workshop focused on the nuts and bolts of academic writing. This is the second year in a row that we invite her to be a feature presenter as part of our pre-conference workshops. Uh, she's currently an associate professor at Texas State University in San Marcos here in Central Texas and uh, is an outstanding scholar in her own right, one of the more prolific scholars that I know. Uh, and uh, if I may just add a point of personal privilege, uh, one of my dear colleague and friends, uh, a longtime collaborator as well. So thank you, Melissa. Thank you to all of our pre-conference session presenters and organizers uh, as uh, we in fact kicked off the, uh, the conference activities in earnest uh, last week uh, on Friday. Okay, I'm gonna keep moving on here. We're almost to the uh, Tomar Rivera lecture. In fact, we are here to the Tomar Rivera lecture. I'll acknowledge first and foremost <clears throat> that we are proud to co-sponsor the annual Tomar Rivera lecture with ETS. And thank you once again to Lenora Green for the opportunity to do that. So, so many of you may be wondering, well, who is Tomar Rivera? And, you know, it's a great question, an important question. And part of the fabric of AHI, and even before it was AHI, the Hispanic Caucus of AAHE, was always to honor and recognize our forebearers that helped to pave the way for so many of us. And uh, we need to always not only know their names, but honor their legacy. And the Tomari Vera lecture emerged as a result of that particular goal, to honor the legacy of Tomari Vera. For 37 years, Ahi has selected a distinguished scholar or national leader to present the Tomari Vera lecture in honor of the late Dr. Tomari Vera, who was a professor, a scholar, a poet, an author, and was president of the University of California, Riverside. And not just any president, he was the first president in the history of the University of California system from the Hispanic community, identified in his case as a Mexican-American. Uh, Dr. Rivera was born in Texas to farm laborers uh, who were Mexican immigrants. Neither of his parents had any formal education. Uh, he attended Southwest Texas State University. Back then, that's what it was known as. Now it's called Texas State University, where he earned his Bachelor of Science and a Master of Education in English and uh, Educational Leadership and Administration. Later, he earned his doctorate at the University of Oklahoma uh, in Spanish Literature and uh, Romance Language. Dr. Rivera also studied Spanish culture and civilization at UT Austin, also studied in Mexico and in ultimately was instrumental in establishing a significant program focused on Spanish literature at the University of Texas San Antonio, where he served as chair of the Romance Language Department. He also served as an associate dean and vice president before he ascended to the role as president of UC Riverside. Um, he became, um, prior to that, also CEO at UT El Paso, um, just before he took on that presidency at UT Riverside, UC Riverside. So he has worked within the UT system and the UC system. He's probably one of a handful of people who could ever say that who have led campuses in, in two of the largest public university systems in the country. Uh, as you might imagine, Dr. Uh, Dr. Rivera's um, um, biography uh, is extensive. And you know, I, I just wanted to acknowledge that as an opportunity to say that for 37 years now, we have used this lecture named in his honor to invite 
a collection of higher education leaders, thought leaders across a variety of different sectors uh, to join us as part of this lecture. As you can see on the screen, the collection of individuals, it reads as a who's who of leaders over the last four decades across this country, um, not just in education or higher education, but in the legal arena, in, in the private sector, uh, scholars, philanthropists, uh, you name it. And, uh, and this year is no different. Uh, it is my distinct honor to welcome uh, Mr. John King, former Secretary of Education under President Barack Obama and the current President and CEO of Education Trust as the 37th Annual Tomari Vera Lecture. Mr. King is a longtime educator, having worked his way up the ranks uh, as an educator. But let me tell you a little bit about his background with respect to his higher education journey as well. Uh, he served at President Obama's cabinet secretary as the 10th U.S. Secretary of Education. And in tapping him to lead the U.S. Department of Education, President Obama called King an exceptionally talented educator, citing his commitment to preparing every child for success. And his lifetime, lifelong dedication to education as a teacher, as a principal, and ultimately uh, as the uh, Secretary of Education. King holds a Bachelor of Arts degree government from Harvard University and his uh, JD, Dr. Jurisprudence from Yale Law School, as well as a Master of Arts in Teaching of Social Studies. He is indeed a former social studies teacher. Very, very proud of that fact. Uh, he also serves currently as a professor of practice at the University of Maryland College Park's College of Education and is a, a member of numerous boards, both in education and the nonprofit sector, um, as you might imagine. Uh, he has uh, been a long time affiliated with various different uh, national research centers, including uh, the National Center for Free Speech and Civic Engagement at the University of California, the National Center for Learning Disabilities, and the National Advisory Council for Prenatal to Three Policy Impact here at UT Austin. He lives in Silver Spring, Maryland with his wife, a former kindergarten first grade teacher, and his two daughters who attend local public schools. And by the way, I know he would welcome you all following him on Twitter and perhaps even engaging and tweeting at him at Twitter. And before I, I invite him, I just want to say I've had an opportunity to, to visit with, with uh, Mr. King on a few occasions, most recently uh, before COVID, we, we shared a meal over barbecue here in Austin. And, uh, you know, I had an opportunity to get to know him and, and speak of our, our collective work together. And it is truly a, 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 such a unique honor and privilege to be able to introduce him now as our 37th annual Tomari Vera Lecture. Please help me welcome John B. King. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Victor, for the introduction. And, and uh, thank you for the honor of, of being able to be a part of this uh, lecture series. It is an impressive roster of speakers, and I'm honored, honored to, to, to be a part of the, the series. And thank you, Victor, for uh, framing our conversation by invoking the memory of, of Tomas Rivera. And in many ways, all of us walk in, I hope, similar paths. Um, not so much one path, but a diversity of paths. His path as a poet, as a teacher, as a scholar, as an administrator, as a Texan, as a Mexican-American. His life, as, although too short, is, I think, a reminder to us all that we walk these many paths and hopefully walk them in the spirit of advancing social justice. We all have these multiple identities. Um, you know, the identity of husband, of father, of, of teacher, of advocate, and for me also occasionally as, um, as policymaker as well. And I hope that in our conversation today, we can reflect on how our work ought to draw on the examples of those who have come before us and build on their legacy. I am both Black and Latino and see very much in my journey and in my daughter's journey, the need to um, tackle the systemic obstacles that have been so much a part of our national history around issues of race and culture. I hope today we'll talk about some of the obstacles that 
continue to plague the country, but also the opportunities that we have to move forward. You know, when I think about my journey, I often think first of my parents. My parents dedicated their whole lives to education. Uh, my father, who was African-American, was born just after the turn of the 20th century in a very segregated New York City and saw a path to opportunity through education as a teacher and an administrator. My mother was born in Ponce, in Puerto Rico, came to New York as a kid, uh, learned English in the New York City public schools, uh, went to City University of New York to Hunter College, a classic New Yorkian story, became a teacher and a school counselor. She was actually the school counselor in my elementary school. And their commitment to education was passed to me. School was always the topic of conversation when I was young. Uh, but they couldn't have known the difference that school would make in my life. Um, both of my parents passed away when I was a kid. Uh, my mom when I was eight, my dad when I was 12. And in the period in between, when it was just my dad and me after, after my mom passed, uh, my dad was quite sick with undiagnosed Alzheimer's. So home was this place that was scary and inconsistent and unstable, but school, school was this place that was safe and engaging and compelling and nurturing. I was very fortunate to have a series of New York City public school teachers who made school a place where I could be a kid when I couldn't be a kid at home. And I chose a career in education because of that difference, the difference of the values that my parents instilled in me and the difference that teachers made in, in my own life. And my first teaching job was actually in, in Puerto Rico where I wanted to spend time teaching and, and having the experience of living there full time, having traveled there a bunch as a kid. And my experience there was a reminder of how deeply embedded in our society are these deep structural inequities. Uh, my experience there was a, was a reminder of the ways in which um, income inequality, inequitable access to opportunity result in um, generational obstacles. And there are parallels to that experience and the, and the experience of my African-American ancestors. In fact, just in the last uh, couple of years, I've gotten to spend time more deeply understanding the journey of my African-American ancestors. And my, uh, turns out that my great grandfather was enslaved about 25 miles from where I live now in Maryland. And the property where he was uh, enslaved is still owned by the family who were direct line descendants of the family that owned my family. And the cabin that my great grandfather lived in with his family is still standing on the property. And so I've had the opportunity to stand in the space where my great grandfather and his mother and his siblings lived as enslaved people. And so I've thought a lot in the last couple of years about these two strands of my personal ancestry and the ways in which both are shaped by institutional injustice, but the ways in which also I can draw inspiration from both my uh, mother's ancestors and my father's ancestors and their ability to live for a future they could not see. Um, my mother was the first in her family to go to college. Um, my father's mother actually was among the first graduates of University of Maryland Eastern Shore, historically black college in uh, the Eastern part of Maryland in 1894. So they made choices, my ancestors made choices to create the possibility of the future that I've been blessed to have. And so I wanna ground our conversation in that story to say, we all, I think, inherit a responsibility to commit ourselves to try to uh, imagine what we can do to make a difference for uh, lives of young people a hundred years from now. What can we do to make a more just future? And I believe that is in the in the spirit of uh, Toma Rivera. Uh, I think about one of his poems, which was uh, "Seeds in the Hour 
of seeds. And some lines from that poem that stuck with me powerfully. He wrote, the seed, mine, yours, is here, we, one. And I draw inspiration from that poem to say each of us can be the seed of a more just future. And we should be particularly mindful of that given the challenge, challenges we face in the current moment. Everyone understands we have in, the, in this current moment navigated through a year of this incredible, uh, incredibly devastating pandemic, but we haven't just dealt with the health pandemic of COVID-19. We've had an economic pandemic that has disproportionately impacted uh, communities of color. In particular, it's had a disproportionate impact on uh, Latinos. There's a survey that was done by Pew that suggested um, that six in 10 Latinos in the United States had experienced either unemployment or loss of income as a result of the COVID economic crisis. Uh, we know that there's been a dramatic increase in unemployment, particularly for Latina women, uh, taking that unemployment rate over 20%. Um, we know that the health impact of COVID has been disproportionately felt uh, in low-income communities and communities of color, particularly communities of essential workers. Um, we know that this economic crisis has compounded economic challenges that existed before COVID. Um, it has really accelerated growing income inequality. Think about the fact that the 650 wealthiest billionaires in the United States are a trillion dollars, more than a trillion dollars richer today than they were before COVID. At the same time, we see folks all across the country struggling with food insecurity, housing insecurity, um, and all of the consequences of this economic crisis. Uh, the pandemic has also exacerbated educational disparities. In the K-12 system, we know we had a digital divide before COVID, but in the period since COVID, uh, it's meant that some students are locked out of even access to education. A, another Pew study before COVID suggested that 79% of white families have reliable internet access, 66% of black families, 61% of Latino families. So think about on top of that um, deeply inequitable infrastructure, putting uh, virtual and hybrid schooling for a year. We know there are kids who still have not logged on. Um, we know there was a, a study that came out today showing that 40% of high school students in the city of Boston have been chronically absent. Uh, we know that there is significant academic learning loss that students will face. McKinsey did a study estimating for uh, Latino students and African-American students we could be looking at as much as six to 12 months of, of lost learning, or as we say, and, and trust unfinished instruction. It's not the student's fault, um, but school has been disrupted and it has taken a toll. We also know there's been a socio-emotional toll for students, and we see the same impact in higher education. We know we've seen a significant drop in enrollment across all of higher ed, higher ed uh, with the exception actually of the for-profit sector. Um, we've seen the steepest drop in community colleges. And again, that drop has been disproportionately for, uh, disproportionately impacted um, Latino students and African-American students. So we, we have these tremendous crises. And then alongside that, we have the, uh, this national reckoning with issues of racial justice and policing and uh, these tremendous threats to our democracy uh, expressed by the events expressed most powerfully perhaps by the events of January 6th that showed us the fragility of our institutions. So in this moment, we all have to rise to meet these crises. And in particular, higher education has a unique responsibility to serve as an engine of social mobility, to try to counter the impact of economic inequality, uh, and also to prepare young people to uh, contribute as um, part of our civic discourse to solve the biggest challenges that we face. And so I, I want to talk about some of the solutions, what I hope 
we can do together. And I hope we can continue that in the conversation after, after the talk. And I wanna argue that colleges and universities, state officials and the federal government all have a role to play in ensuring that higher education is an engine of equity, a sower of the seeds of equity. Public and private institutions of higher education alike depend on public revenue, uh, whether that's in the form of federal research grants, state funding, student aid, or uh, tax benefits. In exchange for this public revenue, colleges, I believe, have a responsibility to serve the public, and that is an increasingly racially diverse public. And there's much more that colleges and universities could be doing to ensure a um, diverse future educated population. For one, they could start by enrolling and truly welcoming the students who represent the broader population. Every institution uh, represented on this call, every higher ed institution, uh, corporation, uh, state and local government, almost every institution, foundation across the country put out some statement last year, last spring, uh, expressing solidarity with efforts to advance racial justice. But unfortunately, those statements have not uh, consistently been matched by action. And at, at the Education Trust, one of the stories that, that we've tried to tell with our research is how wide the disparity is between uh, who is enrolled in our particularly selective admission public colleges and the population of their state. Um, so consider this, in Texas, 14% of the 18 to 24 year olds are black, yet at UT Austin, just 4% of undergrads are black. And if institutions are charged with serving the public of their state, that kind of disparity should be unacceptable. You'd have to triple, uh, the, more than triple the black enrollment to represent the state population. For Latino students, the numbers are somewhat better, but 45% of the, of the 18 to 24 year olds are Latino, 23% of the students at UT Austin. So you'd have to double the percentage of Latino students to represent the population of the state. And what we've found at, at Trust is when you look at selective public colleges around the country, uh, that disparity occurs in state after state. Black and Latino students simply are uh, persistently underrepresented and that is despite some of the rhetoric around affirmative action. Folks who claim that somehow Black and Latino students are getting a disproportionate advantage. Well, the opposite uh, remains true. Black and Latino students are getting inadequate access to selective admission public colleges. And we know the same trends prevail in private higher education institutions. We know that accreditors aren't doing all they could uh, to hold institutions accountable. Uh, for their commitment to serve uh, the population of their state. And we know that institutions are doing too little on the side of recruitment uh, and partnership with community colleges where we know so many Black and Latino students begin their education. So one step is to make enrollment truly reflective of the state population. A second step is to shift financial aid to focus on the students who actually need it the most. Between 2001 and 2017, public four-year colleges spent more than $32 billion on financial aid on students with no financial need at all. $32 billion in the period from 2001 to 2017. The use of so-called merit scholarships uh, has itself become a tremendous obstacle to directing resources to the highest need students. If we want to change who has access to our higher ed institutions, we have to change how we distribute financial aid. Uh, we know that on too many campuses, low-income students are dropping out of college because of an unpaid library fine, because of a car that breaks down and they can't afford to repair it, and so they decide to take off the semester and then they never get back to school. Students who go to the registrar's office and told, uh, you have an unpaid balance, you can't enroll this semester. And at the same time, their institution is giving out resources to affluent students 
who simply don't need those resources at the same level. Uh, there's much more we could do. There are some hopeful examples. Uh, the State University System of New York just last week announced that they're going to greatly simplify the process uh, for getting application fee waivers. They realized that there were many steps where students had to uh, fill out forms and so forth to demonstrate need. And instead, what they're going to say is if you're eligible for free or reduced price lunch, your application fee is automatically waived. We need more steps like that, concrete efforts uh, to make college more accessible. I think about Wayne State University in Michigan that has a program called Warrior Way Back where students who've left school can come back to school and get their debt reduced uh, proportional to the credits they earn as a way of helping students who have some credits, no degree, uh, actually finish their degree. I think about the University of Pittsburgh that's moving funds from merit aid to matching scholarships for their Pell Grant students. I think about the work that Georgia State has done around Panther Grants for just-in-time uh, financial assistance um, for students who are in need. Institutions are taking necessary steps. We need more of them to do that. A third important area of work is to adopt and adapt proven strategies for boosting student success uh, in ways that make sense for their local context. I'm a huge fan of the CUNY ASAP program, which is a wraparound services effort for community college students that's been demonstrated in randomized controlled trials to double community college completion. It's a mix of wraparound services, improved advising, uh, subsidies for transportation in the form of a Metro card, which if you live in New York City, you know it's like gold to have that Metro card for the subway. Um, Just-in-time financial assistance. Now that CUNY ASAP program has actually been replicated in Ohio already uh, at multiple institutions where the institutions gave, uh, adapted it somewhat, they gave gas cards instead of Metro cards. But what they found in Ohio was the same set of wraparound services could yield, again, a doubling of community college completion rates. We need many more efforts like that. Uh, we need to invest in um, efforts to move away from remedial education that leaves students uh, paying for classes that get them no closer to a degree. So I think about uh, the work that's happening in Florida and in California to replace that sort of Sisyphusian uh, experience of remedial courses with co-requisite courses uh, where students are getting intensive academic support alongside um, those remedial courses. Um, instead of those remedial courses. So students are getting intensive support while taking credit bearing courses. Um, what we know is that these kinds of interventions targeted to the students who are most vulnerable uh, will lead to better outcomes. A fourth area of work where institutions have to engage, and I know Victor, this is something you focused on, is we need to think about faculty diversity. In too many institutions, students of color, first generation students just simply don't see themselves reflected on the faculty. Those are institutional choices around hiring decisions that they have to take responsibility for. You can't say in spring of 2020, you believe Black Lives Matter and then have no black faculty. Similarly, you can't say that you are committed to supporting your Latino students on campus and have no Latino faculty. And so institutions have a responsibility in addition to their admissions practices, their financial aid practices, their student support practices, they have to see faculty diversity as a part of their commitment to equity and inclusion. But institutions ought to get support from the state level. We need state policy uh, that helps institutions do the right thing. Uh, we can think about state um, financial aid policies. Too many states have over the last few decades disinvested from public higher education. That has resulted in shifting costs to families and students. Um, we need states 
to have a renaissance in how they think about the role of public higher education to understand that public higher ed is one of the state's best vehicles for economic development. And we need to see more investment. Uh, we would love to see more states putting resources uh, towards um, making college debt free. Uh, we've written it at the Education Trust about some of the college promise programs that are an empty promise, a false promise, where the dollars don't actually get to the highest need students. And so we've got to make sure that the design of these debt free college programs actually get resources to the students most at risk uh, of not being able to afford and complete college. We've got to make sure that states change their policies around undocumented students. Undocumented students ought to be eligible not only for in-state tuition, but they ought to be eligible for state financial aid on the same basis as any other student. And there are some states that have, that have made, that, made that possible, but we have many more states uh, where that is not possible and where undocumented students come to believe that higher education is not for them because they don't see a path towards state uh, assistance. So we've really got to ask states to step up in a different way. And we also need states to lead in how they use their dollars. I think about what New Jersey has done, at least for a portion of their funds, they are trying to reward those institutions that enroll uh, larger numbers of underrepresented students, particularly Black and Latino students. We ought to see more um, states trying to put resources towards incentives for higher ed institutions to do the right thing in terms of enrollment. So we've got the institutional behaviors, the state behaviors, and then we have federal policy. And I think we have some tremendous opportunities. Obviously, it's important that the federal government in the next couple of weeks here steps up uh, to provide immediate resources to address the consequences of, of COVID and the $40 billion roughly that's in the stimulus package is important, but that's just a first step. I actually think we need much more federal leadership on issues of higher ed access, affordability, and completion. I'd love to see a federal commitment to uh, that debt-free college, perhaps in a state-federal partnership where the federal government might provide some of the resources, require a match from the state, and then demand of states that they invest more in public higher ed, that they close the investment gap between their community colleges and their flagships, that they invest in student support programs, and that they take efforts to increase the, the representation of historically underrepresented students on campus. Um, we also need the federal government to help address issues of student debt and the legacy of student debt in ways that help close racial wealth gaps, uh, particularly for uh, Black and Latino communities. Uh, we also need the, the federal government to, in my view, double Pell Grants. So we address the financial challenges going forward for students and families. Think about it. in 1980, Pell Grants accounted for about 80% of the cost of uh, public college, a public four-year college. Today, it's about 28%. And all of that cost has been shifted to students and families. So a doubling of Pell Grants, I think, would take us a good way towards uh, the kind of model for affordability that we need. We also need the federal government to invest in an innovation and research agenda around completion outcomes for historically underserved students and employment outcomes. We need a lot more attention to making sure that students graduate uh, with the support to navigate the job market and see the true economic benefit of their degrees. So let me close with this before we turn to questions. Let me close with, with two thoughts. Um, you know, one, one thing I get asked a lot, particularly in this last year, is uh, places from which to draw hope and why I stay hopeful despite all the multiple challenges that we face as an education sector and as a country. And, and I'd share a couple things. Um, one is we are making progress. And even though it feels like there are, there are lots of times when it's um, two steps forward, one step back, um, we have to celebrate the wins. One, one important 
measure of that progress in the last year was that um, in December, Congress corrected a mistake that, that they had made in 1994. In the 1994 crime bill, Congress banned access to Pell Grants for incarcerated students. It's terrible public policy. 95% of the folks who are incarcerated are coming home. Uh, we are all much better off if folks who, who leave incarceration have more skills to be able to succeed in, with their families and in their communities when they come home. But in 94, during the sort of rush to be quote unquote tough on crime, Congress banned access to Pell Grants for incarcerated students. Hundreds of programs in uh, prisons all over the country closed. Um, in the Obama administration, we created a pilot project to allow 65 colleges and universities to use Pell Grants for incarcerated students. And the idea behind the pilot project was that we would help create an example of why we should re ultimately repeal the ban. Uh, at the time, we got pushback from some members of Congress, um, but we pressed forward with that pilot and actually uh, the pilot continued and uh, Betsy DeVos and I basically don't agree on any issue except maybe this one where she actually continued the Second Chance Pell pilot and grew the program. Um, in December, in a bipartisan effort, uh, thanks to a lot of advocacy, not only by education equity groups like us at Ed Trust, but lots of criminal justice reform organizations, and most importantly, directly impacted students telling their story, sharing their journey, sharing their experience. Um, Congress in a bipartisan way in December repealed that ban. Um, for, for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of folks over the next decade, that will mean access to educational opportunities uh, they never otherwise would have had. And so we have to find hope in those moments of success. Um, we also, I think, need to find hope in the organizing of young people. Um, you know, I think back to last spring with my daughters um, who are 14 and 17 uh, protesting uh, around uh, police violence, protesting for the principle that Black Lives Matter um, in front of the White House last spring with thousands of other folks, racially diverse, age diverse folks, all demanding justice, but so many young people and organized by young people. And so I draw a lot of inspiration from the uh, insistence of young people. I think about um, some of the documented students and their incredible advocacy um, and their insistence that they be seen and heard um, and that their families be seen and heard. Um, that kind of youth organizing gives me a lot of reason for hope. I think about John Lewis's final um, essay that was published just after his death, where he talked about how he, even at the end of his life, was still drawing inspiration from the organizing of young people. And, and the last point, I, I think, again, we have to draw inspiration from those who've come before us and their uh, determination and vision. Um, and so I want to return to another uh, Rivera poem, uh, The Searchers, which I think speaks to us in, in this moment. And there's a part of that poem where he writes, from within came the passions to create of every clod and stone, a new life, a new dream each day. And so we ought to draw inspiration from his words and his legacy and the legacy of those who, who came before us and work to create um, that new life, that new dream, that new landscape of opportunities for young people to build a uh, America that is more true to the values of equality and opportunity. So thanks for the opportunity to be a part of the conversation today. I look forward to more discussions. Thank you so much, John. Uh, everybody, please do a, round, a virtual round of applause. <laughs> if uh, we were all together, you'd hear thunderous, I'm sure, standing ovation, John, for those inspiring, thoughtful, and hopeful words and messages 
And, uh, you know, as you were speaking, many of our uh, conference attendees are, are chiming in with the Q&A uh, potential questions and thoughts. And so my role here is to do the best I can over the next few minutes to moderate and, uh, you know, to kind of pose them to you. So Lisa asked, uh, circle back to earlier in your, your, your lecture, where you referenced the stat about um, that shared that $32 million in aid is being dispersed to students who have zero need um, you know, just another example of many of the inefficiencies of our federal financial aid system. So she was just curious, not more, not a question, but, you know, doing some on the spot fact checking or resource sharing, if you could maybe reference where, where that more information could be had on that count. Yeah, that was a, um, a New America paper. Uh, I'll send you the, the citation, but uh, New America did this analysis and it was uh, $32 billion in, in, um, aid. If you Google uh, New America Merit Aid Arms Race, um, and you'll find the report there, and they, they were looking at the period from 2001 to 2017. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, so Joanne, one of our board members is, uh, actually, she's on the call, Joanne. If you, if you wouldn't mind, let me ask you to chime in real quick, uh, and I'll give you, since she's our immediate past chair of the board, but she had a, an important question, I guess, to point out the, uh, the, the certainly the needed focus on underrepresented students. But what about our graduate student concerns and, and questions? Mm -hmm. You know, Joanne, go ahead if, if you don't mind unmuting yourself. I had just unmuted myself. Thank you, Victor. Uh, Mr. King, thank you so much for your remarks and lovely bookending of the Masrivera poetry to your talk. Um, having been in the graduate education space for the last few years of my life. Um, they remain front and center in my work and my thinking and my thought. And granted, under, getting students through a bachelor's program is really critical, but we can't stop there if we in fact wanna meet the real need of having representation at all levels in higher education. So the question really is how can we get on everyone's radar what the stats are regarding graduate student enrollment and completion? faculty hirings and not at the adjunct level, but at the tenure track level mm -hmm. and administrative hirings. I believe it's um, Cal State San Bernardino and I thought I saw Tomas Morales on the call does an excellent job of compiling a lot of data like that for California. Uh, but if we had that data by state and nationally that would be so powerful. Mm -hmm. and, and then how do we get it on everybody's radar so that we just don't stop educating students at a certain level, but continue yeah. the path and journey. Yeah, it's an, it's an excellent point. I mean, so three observations. One, um, I do think we have to tell the story around data and help draw the connection between the underrepresentation of students in of students of color in graduate education and the disparities in uh, workforce issues. So we, we, ha we don't have the faculty of color that we should because we don't have the graduate students of color that we should. Um, we have a lot of uh, tech companies uh, complaining that they don't have the supply they would want of uh, folks of color for the tech fields. Well, if they would make more of an investment in um, graduate student programs serving uh, students of color, that would help shift that pipeline. So I think your your exact your point is exactly right, and I'll take back uh, with Will Del Pilar, our higher ed VP, who's on the call, how we might contribute to that at Ed Trust. So that's one. Two, um, one place where we're very focused on this issue is around teacher preparation. Uh, we have a huge need for more teachers of color. You know, majority of our kids are kids of color. Only 18% of our teachers are teachers of color. We have huge shortages all over the country uh, in the supply of bilingual teachers in particular. Uh, and teacher prep programs are simply not doing enough uh, to, di to diversify. And we're working with a number of states to try to get state policy focused on teacher diversity. The commission in North Carolina, for example, just made a set of recommendations to their governor and legislature to tackle that issue. Um, the third observation I'd make is, uh, I wish we were starting earlier. Um, 
to focus on supporting students towards graduate education. So I think about uh, the Meyerhoff Scholars Program at University of Maryland, Baltimore County, which has a, a really impressive track record of identifying um, Black and Latino students uh, for future graduate study in science and engineering. And they start working with those students in the undergrad period to help them become a pipeline into uh, graduate experiences. And that program uh, just got funding to, to be replicated uh, at a couple of the UC campuses. And so I really think we have to be thinking about how do we identify students early on to help them have that vision? Because for some students, they may not have that vision of graduate study when they start undergrad. So to that point, um, Victor, if you don't mind, I might just add that the Council of Graduate Schools just produced a, a report on how to create an ecosystem to support, in this particular case, Latinx students starting in the early years mm -hmm. and how institutions have to think more broadly about what the life cycle of a graduate student really is, starting with pre-admissions and all the way to career transition. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that might be um, a tool that might be useful. But related to that, um, the other sort of related question I had was that regrettably, as you well know, this country does, has a history of not making morally, ethically, socially responsible choices when it comes to education, unless there is a federal mandate uh, <laughs> driving it. So how can organizations, and you kind of hinted at this, but maybe we can explore this further down the road, how can organizations like EdTrust provide synergy to help bring these much needed changes about? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's what we exist to do, right? So we're, and, and I think it's really, it's both um, research and putting out the data function, but it's also a really an organizing function. And so in some of the states where we work, um, we've worked to create equity coalitions to put pressure on the states to try to adopt better policies. And in DC, we do a lot of work with um, com a combination really of the civil rights community and the business community to press on these issues. You know, I think we're going to have a big opportunity in the next round of stimulus funding. You know, so this stimulus round, you know, there'll be 130 billion or so for K-12, 40 billion for higher ed. That that helps address immediate needs. But in the next round, you know, President Biden has talked about the next round of, of reconciliation, uh, tackling issues like infrastructure. Well, to my mind, education, higher education, the strength of our public higher education system in particular ought to be a part of how we think about infrastructure. And if we want folks to be prepared for um, engineering, if we want folks to be prepared for green jobs that we'll need in, in renewable energy, uh, we ought to see some significant investment there as part of the infrastructure package. So I hope many of us can work together on pushing there and particularly uh, trying to hold uh, members of Congress and the administration to some of the commitments folks have made around investing in minority serving institutions, um, which is often a campaign point, not always uh, enacted into policy. All right, we have a few more minutes left and there are some great questions coming up here. So I, I'm gonna keep an eye on the clock, but John, Dr. Aubrey, Audrey Baca, one of our conference panel committee members asking about the COVID-19 impacts on enrollment and in particular how the community college sector has experienced significant drops uh, and especially pronounced and disparately impacting of course communities of color and historically underserved. And you know, we don't know yet, we don't have you know, data quite yet for spring enrollment, but I know that many community colleges who are already struggling financially just to keep doors open uh, and who are largely tuition dependent, uh, very sensitive to, to that revenue stream uh, are, are really struggling. And we know these are the open door, open access institutions for so many of our communities. So how is Education Trust working with the community college sector, whether it's your partner, you know, Walter Bumpfus and others in AACC, or perhaps at the state level with community college associations around the country to ensure that there is a, a safety net of sorts available for community colleges, given the pivotal role they play in college access and success for our communities. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a critical point. And um, a couple things. One, I think, you know, I made the point about doubling Pell. 
doubling Pell Grants would be hugely helpful in helping students to be able to um, either come back to community college or stay enrolled in community college. Uh, one of the challenges that we've written about at Ed Trust is that many of these um, state promise programs um, only uh, function as last dollar programs around tuition. And so the result is they sound like they're gonna help low income students, but they don't at all because tuition is covered for the low income students largely by Pell Grants. And so then the state free college program says, oh, well, you're all set, but we know the bulk of the cost for students is everything else, food, housing, often childcare. Uh, so doubling of Pell Grants, you know, that those flexible dollars for students, I think would help us a lot. And so we're working with, with many of the other higher ed organizations, Walter and others on advocacy for uh, that kind of investment going forward. Um, I also think, you know, we're, we're blessed to have in, in Dr. Biden, uh, a huge champion for community colleges. Um, and, you know, she's still on a community college faculty. And I think there are some, there will be some uh, conversation for sure, again, in this next reconciliation bill about how we can invest more in community colleges. We proposed in the Obama administration that we would make community college tuition free, but through a state federal partnership that would incentivize states to invest more in their community colleges, as well as to implement student success initiatives in their community colleges. So I could see some version of that coming up again in this, in this next reconciliation round. So speaking of the Biden administration, in your reference, Dr. Biden, you know, obviously with the new administration, there, there could be a more receptive uh, set of policy and political actors, but yet, as we're seeing with the current round of COVID-19 uh, stimulus, there's plenty of political barriers that still exist. And, you know, obviously education trust kind of helps, well, exists within all these sort of policy and political spaces. So, so whether it's undocumented students or debt-free college or developmental education, those are some of the issues you mentioned, you know, how is that trust helping advance uh, an equity-minded higher ed agenda in light of these very real political barriers that still exist? And just because, you know, President Biden might be in office and there's a new administration, you're still having to work through those sort of dynamics. Can you speak oh, to that a little bit? Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, there, there are a few things we can do. One is uh, we do a lot of work with Congress and trying to make sure that members of Congress understand the dimensions of these issues, understand um, some of the implications of the policy choices they make. For example, we've been advocating that uh, we need to be worried not just about internet access in K-12, but internet access in higher ed. We have higher ed students who can't lock in to their classes. And so we've been trying to persuade folks that uh, new investments in bandwidth have to be comprehensive. And, and sometimes we encounter folks who just haven't thought about um, the higher ed students who are impacted. Um, you know, we, we've been making the case that states need to think about the design of their SNAP programs so that SNAP benefits can be available to students who are enrolled in higher ed programs that lead to careers. And what we found is that when states pay attention to that, they can actually provide SNAP benefits, food assistance to thousands, in some cases, tens of thousands more students uh, just by tweaking uh, their criteria for who is eligible. But again, it's something that isn't necessarily top of mind for folks. So we see part of our role as, as doing that advocacy, both with uh, folks on Capitol Hill and also with uh, governors and state legislatures. But we also need, I think, to, to have more grassroots pressure on legislators. Again, at both the state and federal level, uh, they end up hearing a lot from elite institutions and hearing less from the institutions that are really the backbone of our higher education system, community colleges and regional publics. And, you know, as you all know, disproportionately members of Congress attended 
those elite institutions. Disproportionately, they attended four-year on-campus experiences. And so I'm regularly with policymakers who um, just haven't thought about the fact that in many of our colleges, you know, nationally, we've got 20% of students who are parents. And so their considerations are totally different. But for many of them who went to four-year elite private institutions directly from high school, they just haven't thought about today's college student and what, what that looks like. So, um, you know, we, we try through advocacy, but also through organizing, because I think we have to have members of Congress and legislators feel like at every public meeting, somebody's going to show up and ask them, what have you done for community colleges? How are you uh, contributing to diversifying uh, the student population at our selective admission public colleges? Those kinds of questions. Well, you touched on so many issues that uh, actually are also reflective of the many concurrent sessions, breakout sessions, uh, scholarly papers, you name it, that we're going to be engaging in over the next few days, John. And, and I just, I got to tip my hat once again. I think you've really helped to set the tone for our conference as part of the uh, 37th annual Tamari Vera Lecture. And again, uh, on behalf of a very, very grateful board of directors and membership, we can't thank you enough again for spending this time with us and helping to uh, charge and inspire us as we head into our, our first ever virtual conference, but our 16th annual conference as well. So once again, I'll invite everybody to give, me, give uh, John a, a virtual round of applause here uh, for, for uh, some great thoughts today. Thank you so much. And if I may just add, because I know Will as well, anytime I hear you or anyone say you're gonna give Will some more work, I, I'll just give a thumbs up on that. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> he'll, he'll certainly <laughs> he'll appreciate it all right so we got a few more things to do before we break out to um, our uh, concurrent sessions and uh, I'm going to share my screen one more time and uh, just give a few uh, last minute instructions about what to expect the rest of the day and again if you're not already following John on Twitter or whatever social media uh, channel you might subscribe to. I, I highly encourage you. I know he's very, very active in those spaces and helping to advance uh, this equity-minded agenda on behalf of the Education Trust, but also carrying the legacy forward uh, from his time in President Obama's administration and going ahead uh, as well with the current administration. So let, let me reference the uh, conference at a glance. The, uh, the remaining days here are, are going to look kind of similar in terms of the way we're structuring. We're gonna convene every day at 12 p.m. Eastern time and go till about 5 p.m. Eastern time. And in between we'll have open, uh, plenary sessions to start the day, usually the first two hours as we did today. So thank you for hanging in there. It's been a long afternoon already. Um, and then followed by various different concurrent session breakouts. Um, and so, you know, I'm also gonna just acknowledge you. We just heard from John King um, you know, later this week, we're going to have our fifth annual Cigarroa Family Lecture featuring Dr. Q, uh, Dr. Alfredo Quinones Hinojosa, who is chair of neurosurgery at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, if you don't know uh, Dr. Q or his story, I, I, I guarantee you're in for a treat. I encourage you to come back for that uh, later this week. And then we're also going to feature two different panels that are timely and relevant topics for our community. Um, Tomorrow we're featuring a panel, a plenary panel on colorism in Latinx higher education featuring Hector Adames, um, who is a professor in, in counseling psychology and Nayeli Chavez Duenas, professor in also in counseling psychology. Um, and, uh, and then followed by uh, Thursday, our final, our concluding plenary session will host a, a panel focused on COVID-19's impact on the Latinx community uh, featuring some outstanding researchers in the STEM areas, including Alicia Fernandez from the University of California, San Francisco, Dr. Alicia Fernandez, and also Dr. Amelie Ramirez uh, from the University of Texas Health Center in San Antonio, and also a member, one of the few Latinx members of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. And I think one of only one or two Latinas currently uh, that's a member of that particular prestigious academy. Uh, that panel will be moderated by Dr. Maggie Rivas Rodriguez, who's my colleague here at UT Austin, professor in the School of Journalism and the founder of the uh, Voices uh, Oral History Project. And then finally, of course, we're going to feature 43 different concurrent sessions. Uh, and that includes five different session types throughout the four days, 
uh, including posters and roundtables and symposia, skill-based workshops, and of course, research papers. In addition to that, we're intermingling various different commission scholarly papers. We have four different commission scholarly papers spread across each day. Uh, and of course, featuring our three outstanding dissertation award research presentations from the winners of the uh, ODC competition this year. Uh, first, second, and third place winners. And then one last thing as a reminder, just some do's and don'ts, some best practices for the remainder of our conference. Be sure to download our conference program. Uh, as a conference attendee, you should be able to uh, uh, download it. It's just a great handy resource to be able to not only follow along and, and find the session of choice, but also to learn more about our presenters and each of the sessions. Um, so uh, please uh, avail yourself of that very, very important resource. Again, you'll be getting daily email reminders from our AHI staff, just giving you helpful and handy uh, links to the various sessions. Um, I'll encourage you once again to use speaker view throughout your uh, Zoom experience just to maximize the opportunity you have to engage with the whoever it is might be speaking. And then finally, uh, I'll encourage you once again to tag, post, and share on social media through our AHI social media channels, and of course, using the hashtag AHI21. Okay, so uh, we'll encourage all of you to enjoy the rest of the conference. Uh, and to be sure to fill out the feedback form. You'll also be getting messages every day from our AHI uh, staff to remind you to fill out your feedback forms. And we'll ask you to fill one out for each and in, each individual session that you attend. You can use the same link for each different day uh, and instructions to that effect will be given as part of that email reminder. All right, so where are we right now in time? We're doing good. I'll give you back six minutes, our concurrent session uh, breakout begin uh, at two uh, three o'clock Eastern time. Uh, once again, I want to thank all of you for uh, joining us at the uh, AHI 2021 National Conference, our first ever virtual experience. And uh, and I thank all of the uh, the members of our association that helped make this conference possible, from our conference uh, planning committee co-chairs to our graduate uh, student fellows program co-chairs to our distinguished members of the board of directors as well. And of course, our, our partners at AMC, uh, Lucia Gutierrez, uh, Doreen, um, and, and so many other staff behind the scenes that have been helping us uh, coordinate uh, over the next few days, all right? So with that, uh, uh, I'll look into our board chair, Dr. Arredondo, are we uh, good to go to, to go ahead and adjourn our opening plenary session? She gives me the thumbs up. And, uh, and so we will now transition, so thank you all. Please have a safe uh, and engaging rest of the week joining us at the AHI 21 conference.